Awesome, thank you. Well, I was really excited that you had invited me to come. This is a new experience for me. Usually we're performing tricks, um, or uh, some of the things that I've done is seminars for service dog trainers, movie trainers, um, but mostly family pet training, reactivity, and performance. So Pickles here is one of my superstars. Pickles started her performance career at only four months of age. She performed on the Family Channel with my six-year-old in front of a in front of a in a studio audience. It was quite fantastic. And then when Pickles was one and a half, she was one of the top stunt dogs in North America on Good Morning America Live in Times Square as a timid dog. Actually, um, I was concerned about her performance, but she actually performed per perfectly with another trainer which was uh, a little sweat inducing. <laughs> uh, but no, she did a great job. She was competing against me and my own dog. And of course, thank goodness we won. Could you imagine she uh, pretended to be another team and she beat us. Lollipop is a, is a two-year-old Boston Terrier. She is completely deaf. And it's something new that I'm starting with the dogs is I wanted to step off and try a deaf dog and show all the children in our, um, in our shows that deaf dogs are just as capable and in fact, Lollipop's taking over the show, which is very exciting. And then, of course, we have our cat who believes that she is a dog. She's a lot of fun, and the show is turned into, yeah, yeah, where's the cat? You know, <laughs> which is a lot of fun, and it is a challenge, and I can say it was extremely difficult. So I came to talk about the principles that we use for training the dogs, family pet, and performance, and some of my secrets, so to speak. So. Uh, the style of training that I use on the dogs is positive dog training. It's also known as progressive reinforcement training, force-free dog training. So they call science-based dog training is another favorite. And I like to go through the names to kind of highlight some of the principles. So positive dog training, there's a lot of myths surrounding it. People feel that positive dog training means reward the good, ignore the bad. And that simply is only halfway there. We do reward the good but we prevent reinforcement of the unwanted behavior. You can't really say bad because a lot of the behaviors are very natural to dogs. So in our opinions, they're bad or unwanted. Um, it's prevent reinforcement of the unwanted behavior through either management of the dog or the environment while we replace the behavior with something that is a wanted behavior. So that's one component of positive reinforcement training. Another is, uh, then other people feel that we should call it progressive reinforcement training because progressive steps are something that is unique to clicker trainer or positive dog trainers. So back in the day, traditional dog trainers would have, let's say their classes would be Sunday morning. Everybody shows up on Sunday morning and everybody has the same criteria. If you don't hold a five minute stay, you get a correction and that is how you learn. Generally, the dogs were asked to join the class at six months of age because that's when they felt that these dogs could handle the corrections and the learning. With progressive reinforcement steps, everything is taught in a series of steps. So, for example, for the dogs to stay on their mats, we wouldn't just ask them to, to perform this task and correct them when, they're, uh, when they don't. We would teach a down. We would add duration. Then we would add the distraction level of uh, people, new environments, and we would only ask them for what they perform and in the initial phases reward heavily for the stay. And I'm going to show you, actually I have a very unique application of how I teach that, so that's one of the uh, ways that I'm going to show you some of my secrets that we don't learn in the classes, so you're going to get the real nitty gritty secrets. Um, my, might I add though, your dog is being exceptional, so check on check mark for me <laughs> Woo! he comes to me <laughs> so one of the examples that I like to use for progressive steps is every day for people let's say your dog is overexcited at the door um, what happens with everyday um, pet owners is let's say your friend recommended that you use a mat to teach your dog to stay what most people do is they wait till the guest comes over they then at that time try to teach the dog to stay on the mat and the dog gets a correction for getting off the mat. The dog is expected to learn on the fly and the dog is expected to perform at the most difficult task. Now a progressive reinforcement trainer or dog trainer would do the progressive steps that I had mentioned for the stay. We teach it down, increase duration, add the mat, 
Then we would add the mat in the location where we want the animal to perform without the distraction of the guest, open and close the door, add the elements that the animal will be asked to perform in, and finally when the animal is ready, add the distraction level of the guest coming through the door. And this is what everybody forgets is the progressive steps that leads us there so that the animal can be successful and positive punishment or corrections are actually not necessary when you're using that sort of training. Now there is consequences. The consequences don't have to be physical. Consequences are you don't get the reinforcing experience of saying hello until you lay down and offer me a relaxed behavior. So that's one of the things that we look at as progressive steps. My other favorite is science-based dog training. Uh, some of the trainers, I like to call it science-based dog training. I just like to think of it in terms of what motivates behavior. And the thing that I never think about when I'm training the dogs is dominance. It's uh, almost irrelevant to me. I always think of emotions and consequences. Emotions in terms of overexcitement, stress, um, consequences in terms of the reinforcing experience of the greeting. <laughs> so we always, or not being allowed to say hello or being confined to another room if we're really um, being inappropriate or moving farther away are uh, negative consequences for them. So um, emotions are something that are often overlooked in training and that I always try to, in a low level in obedience classes we discuss it in uh, behavior modification for reactivity, aggression, fear, it is the main focus. But I do touch on this in my, ba my basic classes for a few reasons. Uh, emotions is in everything that I do. For the dogs to lie down, we specifically worked on impulse control. We worked on not being afraid in this environment because when fear happens, cognition decreases and the dogs are gone or hiding or barking or unable to relax. And that's another one of the components of positive dog training that I really like because what you see here is happy, relaxed dogs. And I don't get that with corrections when I used to train that way, when everybody used to train that way. I think a lot of us started that way 20 years ago. So one of the examples that I like to use in my classes for emotion is resource guarding. Dog gets an item that they don't want to relinquish. Owner tries to take the item, dog growls. Most people try to apply consequences to a situation like that. Like, no, that's unacceptable. Let's teach the dog that that is something that is unacceptable. In the dog's case, the dog then learns that I have an item. I don't want my owner to take it. My owner is going to take it, and I'm going to have um, a scary situation happen. That's a double negative. For a positive dog trainer, we just change the emotional state that's driving the behavior. You don't like it when I take your bone. Let me take it, put peanut butter on it, and give it back. Not by teaching on the fly with progressive steps like we always use. So that would be one example of changing the emotional state to change the behavior. Another example I like to use is, as I always say, I never hang out when we have a barbecue. If there's a dog that has any sort of issue, I have to say something because I feel, well, I have information that could really help your dog, so let's turn everything into a training session. So we're having a barbecue four-month-old chihuahua is there and the chihuahua is showing fear to the guests and as I look at the chihuahua I think if I say something now I can change the course of this dog's life hopefully by giving the owners some even subtle tips of course subtle tips are never as good as sitting down and having a full lesson but it's better than nothing so the owner says to another guest um, one of the things that I hate is begging. I never reinforce my dog from the table. I hate begging. And that was my cue. I said, um, actually, if I can step in, your dog is showing signs of fear, fear of the people. So if everybody here pulls a piece of hot dog off their table, their plate, feeds it to your dog, your dog could develop a begging issue, but your dog will develop a positive association with people, which will decrease reactivity. So you have two choices. What is more important to you? a dog that begs, which later on in life you can just put the dog away or stop reinforcing the dog once they develop a positive conditioned emotional response with people. Or you can not, not feed the dog and the dog won't beg, but the dog could develop reactivity later. So for me, I always pick the lesser of the two evils. Emotion is always my first criteria and everything else can come later. 
So that's one of the ways that I look at emotions in training. It's, it, it is a criteria. It is my most important, is that we're not afraid, and we do have impulse control. So um, back to reinforcement, because reinforcement is one of the most important things in training behaviors. Um, we have a big <laughs> frame on the wall of our dog training that says, dogs do what works. I think we all do what works, right? So dogs do what works. So in terms of reinforcement, it's something that's really important to think about and understand when we're interacting with our dogs. So there is an example that I like to give, which is back to jumping up at the door. Let's say I come to your home and you have a young six-month-old dog. And your issue with your dogs is jumping up at the door. And you've hired me as a trainer. And this is the first interaction that you're going to watch me have with your dog. So I come inside and your dog's jumping on me. Um, I make three choices and we can assess these choices. First choice, I turn when he jumps and pet him when he sits. Second choice, I say off, that's bad, to try to talk to him and communicate what I want, which is the choice that everybody makes. And the third choice is you're ready with a choke chain and you give the dog a correction when he jumps. So to assess each, we're going to look at consequences and emotions. Number one, I turn when he jumps. I pet him when he sits. This is obviously removing reinforcement and providing reinforcement when I see what I like. Um, that's the one that I like to choose, but that misses the point of managing the dog for, su for success. So we get to step back to that. Number two, what everybody does, off, that's bad, a reinforcer. The dog gets attention. We think we're talking to the dog. We are reinforcing the dog with the very thing the dog wants, which is attention. And number three, we correct the dog when the dog jumps up, which sometimes works, but often causes a negative association when people come inside. To me, in my experience, I've shown that it increases stress which uh, does not create a calm dog, which is what we're trying to do. We can train the dog to be calm by the way that we handle the dog. So we, I do like to turn when the dog jumps and pet the dog when he sits. However, anybody in that situation has noticed in a young dog that age, you're just doing a dance, right? They're just standing and jumping all over you and, and the dog's not in a cognitive state because they're too over aroused. So that misses the other point, is always consequences and emotions. And that's where mat training comes into play. That's why people suggest the mat. People have heard about the mat. The mat's to calm the dog down. So the dog is in a thinking state when the dog approaches the people. And that's managing your environment, managing your dog, setting them up for success, or what we like to call errorless learning. So when the guest comes through, you've done all your prep work. Your dog is ready for the distraction. You're going to put the dog on a down on a mat. The guest is going to come inside. And when the dog is calm, and you're ready to reinforce that calm with the greeting, you can release the dog. And the guest will either turn when he jumps and pet him when he sits, or you will remove the reinforcing experience of the greeting by pulling the dog back if he is jumping. So that the dog learns through, consistent, through consistency. You get to say hi when your four feet are on the floor, and when you're inappropriate, you get taken away. So that's understanding consequences and emotions, but there's the point that most people miss in society uh, with dogs, just because dogs are viewed differently. And there's a fantastic book by Jean Donaldson. It's called The Culture Clash. And she wrote a fantastic book about how dogs are expected to be Disney dogs in this day and age. They're expected to be perfect. They never growl. Whereas 30 years ago, if the dog growled, well, don't go near the dog when it's eating. A dog was al allowed to be a dog. Whereas now, we expect perfection. So one of the things I always say is to uh, take maturity into account. If a six-month-old dog uh, is not getting it not to jump up, it is simply because they are still a baby and they need more impulse control and maturity until the lesson is learned. So you're going to handle your dog with the mat every time somebody comes over until the dog is ready. I usually find that to be about one and a half, maybe two, <laughs> when, when the lessons you're teaching start to finally register. So that's, um, that's and, uh, one of the examples that I like to use 
in terms of reinforcement. The other example that I like to use in terms of reinforcement is when people walk into class, and you see this a lot, they walk into class, dog first. Dog walks us up to everybody. We just follow the dog around the room, and <laughs> um, the dog learns through socialization as a puppy that the dog is the center of the universe because they're cute, fuzzy, and everybody comes running towards them, and we're improperly taught that socialization means that everybody and everyone should touch our puppy, and our puppy should meet everyone and like everyone. But part of socialization is learning that you don't get to say hi to everybody, and that when you try to take that greeting, you're not going to have it. So when I take my puppy to, Rona is one of my favorite places, because they do allow dogs. If my puppy is trying to take greetings, you can't have them. I want my puppy to play puppy hard to get. I don't want it. Oh, I can have it, thank you. Um, so one of the things that people don't often ask me to pet my dogs because my body language is such that I'm engaging and working with my dog. And if I see somebody wants to, I'll ask them, did you want to say hi? Yeah, just give me a second. Dog has to lay down and focus on me and get permission. Um, so that the dog still gets to say hi, but we're reinforcing appropriate and polite behavior and often people ask are they sick are they scared why aren't they lunging towards me no no that's what trained looks like um, we want to treat the dogs along the same lines as service dogs so now a lot of people hear that the dog should sit before they get the leash and sit before they get things and that is true simply because we don't want to use those environmental rewards to reinforce so uh, you know um, the training I always tell my clients starts at home. You pull out the leash, you wait for a set, leash goes on, door opens. Door opening is a, leash is a reinforcer. Door opening is a reinforcer. And all sorts of environmental rewards that we don't think about, because we always think about food, toys, and praise. But, oh, I'm the one talking session. <laughs> You'll get your turn. <laughs> um, but. Uh, but yeah, so always think about various reinforcers and reinforcement in training. So I do have some fun examples of um, reinforcers, but oh, there's one more thing. We were talking about taking into account the animal's emotional state and maturity levels, but also we were also talking about breed and how breed comes into play as well. So when you're training your dog, you're going to be aware that your cattle dog is going to be mouthy, your golden retriever loves everybody, and your beagle wants to smell everything. And sometimes your terriers don't like other animals <laughs> because they're bred for vermin killing. So um, what I like to do is also uh, offer an outlet for those behaviors. You know, uh, cattle dog, play frisbee. Um, I like to teach beagles to scent. Or uh, use the pre-mag principle. If you look at me, you can explore with your nose as a reinforcer for looking at me. So that's uh, really key as well. Now what I have is um, some fun ideas for showing you how I would apply um, reinforcers for teaching a stay, which is different than I teach other people even to teach their dogs. It's a more advanced complex for, uh, concept for teaching a stay because it involves environmental rewards. So who's it going to be, eh? We've fallen asleep. <laughs> Am I boring? Am I boring you? Pickles, did you want to do the examples? So. <laughs> Look, she's yawning. Oh dear. Well, as long as we're just putting the dogs to sleep and not the people. <laughs> Wait there, sweetheart. Now, this is a, um, a way that I like to teach the stay. I actually teach the stay um, by tying up the dog initially, and I remove the leash as the dog is successful. So I've got my fun points here that I, that I use for teaching the stay. One is um, I manage the environment so the dog can't fail and that's why I tie the dog up so that the dog is actually set up to succeed. One of my most important things is errorless learning. My dogs are always set up to win and then I make it successively harder. So my love you want to go first. I'm going to show you the example and then I'm going to explain sort of the principles. This is not one that I uh, teach often because it is a little more complex but since we're talking about reinforcers and environmental rewards. Now, <clears throat> as I'm training my animal, I like to think about everything. How cold is the floor? Is it going to be hard for her to put her tummy down? Is that going to be a punisher as opposed to a reinforcer? 
Which I think it would be because we don't have any fur. So I might give you a bed. All right, baby, it's time for some treats. Um, I'm going to start without the bed. Okay, so um, <laughs> I like to start by tying her up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to teach Pickles to offer me a down. So first step, offer me a down for a reinforcer. The reinforcer is food. The second step is I add distance. And the dog wants me to come back. Most dogs will bark or try to walk towards you. And the dog has two choices really when they're tied. Bark or go back to the offered behavior that I originally showed you. So I'll show you some of the steps. So first we wait. Now all my dogs are shaped and a lot of choice is used in their training. Yes, good. Okay. Lollipop's playing. <laughs> okay. I go from crouching to standing, because to a dog, crouching and standing are very different. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Once the dog understands this up close, now I'm going to add some distance. Dog wants me to come back, so the dog has two choices, bark or off or down. Yes. And what happens when the dog offers it down is the environmental reward of me returning, which is what the ac dog actually wants, is what the dog's getting as a reinforcer. So we stand her up again, we add more distance. Yes, good girl, good girl. Okay, good job. Okay, so we'll put you back up. And I'm gonna explain you where I take that. Okay, hop. So um, what happens when I'm teaching the dogs is Pickles, actually Pickles and Lollipop could both hold a 20 minute stay at a fair with a uh, petting zoo across from us, a clown that comes around and goes, hey! <laughs> Uh, a live racetrack behind us, hot dogs, children, balloons, and when we perform our show, the dogs sit on the box while the other dogs are chasing balls and doing high arousal things. Um, I did that initially so that the, I can pull a dog off as I needed, so a stay was a very important behavior. So um, I wrote down some very important uh, and interesting points with that. So one is uh, using the environmental reward of returning to the dog as a reinforcer. Two, errors, errorless learning. The dog's managed, so the incorrect choices are limited. So the dog has two choices, really bark or lay down. Uh, choice, the dog is taught to offer a behavior so that if they make the wrong, if I tell the dog to lay down when the dog is being inappropriate, we're going back to off bad attention during inappropriate behaviors is a reinforcer because the dog wants the attention. So if I'm over here and she barks at me and I say, no, down, and I'm reinforcing the barking. So choice is the key element for um, not reinforcing things I don't want. It also increases motivation significantly. So almost all of my behaviors are shaped or taught with choice. And I do touch on that with a lot of my intermediate clients because it is more advanced, but significantly more effective. Also, um, there is a negative consequence. The negative consequence is not a physical one, but when the dog barks at me, I turn around. If the dog continues to bark, I walk away, and then I go, let's try this again. And the dog offers it down to get me to come back. Later on, once the dog is successfully holding the stay for a long duration, so if you're doing this at home, you're gonna do it when you're doing dishes or making dinner, tie the dog up and you walk back, treat, leave, make dinner, walk back, treat, leave. And later, if Pickles or Lollipop are not holding their stays, they lose the privilege of sitting out here and they go in the back in the crate or they go in another room. Now, I don't like to look at the crate as a punisher. I like to look at it, this as a privilege. So they like to be out where the treats happen. Treats happen here, they don't happen anywhere else. So in my training room, I have a um, gated area which is the waiting area where they sit if they don't 
Listen, it's actually so effective that sometimes I'm running through the house searching, I lose a dog, I've got seven. It happened this morning. I was like, where's my popcorn? Popcorn, where are you? And, I, and she's sitting behind the door going, if I bark, she's not coming for me, so I better be quiet. <laughs> and then I find her, ah, oh, thank goodness I found you, right? Yeah. All right, so now that's a, one of the life examples, but of course we want to do some fun examples, right? Because we've got some trick dogs and we need some eye candy. Um, so what I like to do is I like to talk about utilizing errorless learning. Um, and, and my biggest secret, separating your criteria, breaking the behaviors down into as many different steps as possible. That's how I am. I provide errorless learning. So I'm going to show you something fun, skateboarding, and how we turn skateboarding into an easy task by breaking it down into separate behaviors. Um, and then that's why we have our little buddy here too. We're going to teach him some skateboarding today or see how far we're going to get. And, uh, and emotion as criteria and trick training. So. I, f I think we should start with the cat because the cat's the most fun and then we'll go back to the dogs. But everybody was so polite here, nobody started yelling, where's the cat? In the middle of, so uh, <laughs> just to show the impulse control of adult versus children. All right, so, come here sweetheart. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that you can do to manage emotion is make sure everything is consistent. Animals don't like change. so. When you're training a cat, cats are both prey and predatory. They, um, they act out as both. They have a lot of nervousness in new environments. So one of our biggest challenges was to train the cat to be comfortable in all environments. So initially when we perform a task, come here for a second, sweetheart. While I'm talking, don't, don't want you to run off. We set up the same, in the show, we set up the same ring. So essentially, it's like putting my living room everywhere. So that was one easy way to start the cat in new environments and then generalize to an environment like this with a new dog and people and all sorts of new. <laughs> Just like, stop talking and feed me. Um, <laughs> so we acclimate the cat number one. And I don't think we have to acclimate you anymore. Although you're going over to see your dog friend. She likes dogs. She doesn't like cats. You're flirting. All right. It wasn't happening fast enough. Now, I want to talk, just to talk about reinforcement, cats are smarter than dogs. My cat runs away all the time like this. Call me back so I get a treat. Because <laughs> she outsmarted me because she's a little smarter than the cats. I'm just going to warm her up with a couple things here. I'm going to get her focus. Uh, targeting is, a, is something that I always teach animals. Touch. Yes. All right. We'll warm you up with a trick you know to, before we do a new one. Touch. Ready? Giddy up. Yes, there we go. Good girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Loves that one, Chachi Mean. Ready up. Over here. You got slight puffy tail. Ready up. No, no, here. Oh, and now we're being a cat. We're going to stiff me. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Now I'm going to show you a new behavior that she's learning and how we would go back to a new behavior. So what are we separating our criteria? Criteria is the actual behavior, it's environment, it's emotional issues, like high is scarier. So I'm going to be new environment, uh, no gates. I'm going to decrease the criteria of the behavior that I'm asking. It's a new behavior and then we're going to go back to our original. So our end behavior is to climb across the blocks. New behavior, because we haven't performed this one yet, I start with a low block. We're going to shape everything so that choice um, decreases fear, so that she doesn't feel forced. See, we're not getting the behavior, we're going to stop. In part because she came out to work and I started talking and she's like, it's different, I don't like different. Check in my hands for chicken. Yes, treating her for turning and orienting. Ignoring the one I don't, the behavior I don't like. Yes, reinforcing for progressive steps closer to, yes, she knows what to do. <laughs> 
Yes. Now, I always advocate for studying your animal's body language. Um, I am an expert in dog body language, not in cat. This, to me, it looks like excitement. I believe it to be stress. Um, she does it a lot when she gets stressed and over aroused. So it, it is both. It could be over arousal or stress. Yes, something I should know and study. <laughs> but there's not a lot of cat behavior experts. And so now I'm going to go back to um, an increased difficulty. And we retrain every behavior in every new environment, essentially. Jimmy. Yes. Yes. Pretty. Break. All right, and then we're going to up a step. Hey, baby. Break. And now, um, every year when I teach a new behavior, I have to retrain that in, I can only perform last year's behaviors for the start of the show, and I have to retrain the new behaviors um, in the warm up. In the, we call it the pre-show. And because every time you train a behavior, you have to go back down to the, pre, the original steps in a new environment. All right, so this is the end goal. We'll see. I need to get rid of her, though. <laughs> so hold on, baby. Not yet. That's what happens when they get shaped, eh? They don't have the patience to wait. OK. Sometimes she knocks it over just to be a stinker, I think. <laughs> because she's a cat. Cats spontaneously forget things. <laughs> oh, you're just a stinker. Cat training 101. Nobody wants to do it. Yes. That was lovely, Pickles. No, no, no. You're cheating. There you go. You know what to do. <laughs> and then that's why we retrain new behaviors. So what we're going to do then is we're going to go to two blocks. OK, baby. Yes, it's very, I think you are actually overexcited. Pretty. Break. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, and then we'll try our new one. And this will be our test subject to see if we're ready to perform this one this year. All right. I'm going to put her on a mark so she's got a starting point. Ready, Mark? Yes. Fun thing about cats is they are very vindictive, eh? I don't know, you can't really attribute human emotions to animals, because who knows? However, I do get punished if I forget to reinforce. Is the camera scary? Did you just notice it? Cat's like, who, what are we growling at? Are we in danger? <laughs> forget it. And there is our example of emotions in training. Nobody's out there. Yes. This is your last chance, or we're kicking you out of here. Looking at the door. First rule in cat training, patience. There. No, you're not doing it. OK, so then I'm going to go back down, and I'm going to do two, and then I hold it for her. Come here, sweetheart. Oh, it's most likely the changes. I think this would be a stress behavior. Come here. Yes. Very nice. Treat for you. And one more. Reducing our criteria with holding it. And look, I've resorted to luring. <laughs> Pretty. All right. That's it for you. Good job. And, and at the end, she's always just pretty even. <laughs> now, dogs, oh, you're purring. Now, dogs are, um, as you can see, much easier. We taught lollipop 
um, and pickles both to skateboard. And the more we put the foundation behaviors on them, the more confident they become. So skateboarding in turn taught Lollipop to be comfortable with unsteady surfaces and Lollipop can actually perform the cat's block trick. But first let's showcase our, our previous step. Are you ready, Touch? There we go. Yeah! <laughs> Good job. And let's have Pickles. Pickles, you're lounging, girl. Come on, Pickles. Oh, no, we're fighting now. Come here, baby. Okay, Pickles, touch. Okay, Pickles, give her. <laughs> and turn it around. Bring it back. Go on it. Bring it back. Push it. Yeah! Push, push, push. <laughs> All right, Pickles. Good. <laughs> So those serve as a foundation. Now Lollipop is not afraid of items um, and obstacles. So we actually took Lollipop back to no love. Yes, now we're all fighting. You don't know this one, Pickles. You don't even know this one. <laughs> Come on, hop, hop, hop. That was no chicken in my hand. Okay, sweetheart, you want to show? New one. Yeah. Yeah, good. Woo! I think we can call this evidence 101 why we should never do a strictly cat show. Mix the cat in with the dogs. All right, and one more. <laughs> no, is she? Oh, man. She's out. <laughs> you got her, baby. Good job. All right. Good girl. Let's save our kitty. Oh, she's poking her head out the bottom? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we did lose her at an event one year. My sister lost her. She says, the cat's gone. We found her eyeing the little raised reptile crocodile. <laughs> she was, my sister thought she was going to jump in. <laughs> Fortunately, she did not. The adventures of working with uh, performance animals. All right, so now we're going to go to teaching uh, our little sweetheart here how to ride a skateboard. So I have, where is, oh, it's right here. I got, chick I got chicken. Can he have chicken too? This is whenever I think he'll smell it in my pocket and want some. Now wait till these guys get real jealous, eh? Hey? <laughs> All right, so skateboarding is actually a series of behaviors put together. Be comfortable in an unsteady surface. Um, four paws on something. Look at that, we're jealous. No, no. Four paws on something. Um, back end awareness. And um, obviously the confidence of the movement. So those are the series of behaviors that we put together. So we're going to shape it. Yay! Listen to that nose, eh? Now you're nervous. You're like, come on, baby, make mama look good. So I wait. There is no wrong in shaping. Now I'm going to take the animal away from the item that I'm shaping. I'm going to separate my criteria, and I'm going to go back to, even though he might knows it with you, they don't generalize from person to person. Don't mug me for treats. <laughs> So when you back off, the hand opens. Hand smells like chicken. This is a famous game. It's called the, now he's given us a sit pretty, hoping that's it. It's called the it's your choice game. And you apply consequences. When the animal backs off, you open your hand. New delicious. And deliver with the other hand. And as long as you stay away, the hand will open, and that means an opportunity for reinforcement. Oh, <laughs> you're kind of, you're iffy, like your nose is right there. And you're giving me that sit pretty, which you know I like. There. Now again, uh, he probably knows this with his own owner, and uh, chicken, 
comes into play. And that's the other thing about working with both dogs and cats is you have to use chicken with everybody or they go, what is she getting? There we go. All right, so that would be a game that I would go back to, although he, he knows it with you. And now we're going to shape the item, so we wait. Yes, one paw on. Yes, orienting away from my hand. Oops, we remove the opportunity for reinforcement when we lay down, because that's the opposite of what we want. We don't want that. Yes, two paws. That's a happy tail. Now one thing I'm going to go back to is I'm going to, I, what you're going to notice about me, I constantly change my plan. <laughs> Sorry, Pickles. I know that he knows four paws on a bed, so I'm going to, um, but first he has to smell because one time there was a treat there that smelled good and I'm a, I'm a beagle. So that's what we do. Yes. 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 OK. Prevent reinforcement off the floor. Yes. Four paws on again. And now, now some of these behaviors we would stay on for longer. I'm going to put this as a cue on top of it. I'm going to go to some chicken. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Whoa, his mind is going to explode. Yes. Oh my god. Oops, I don't like a sit. Oops. So I'm going to treat faster. Yeah, I bet the chicken's cooler than anything. Yes. OK, we'll take a sit for now. But in the future, we would want to stand. OK. Remove the, the cue. Oh, the chicken is so good. I can't think. Yes. Yes, yes, jackpot. Now, as I said earlier, pivoting the back paws and rear end awareness is something. We want him to pivot his back paws onto the board and push with his back paws, right? So dogs only think about the front two paws. So that would be another, yes, very nice. And we're getting a stand. I'm treating low so I get the stand. Yes. All right, now I'm going to, no, thank you. I'm going to go to the skateboard, but I'm going to turn this easier cue. Oh, smack the dog in the face. Yes. Try to hold it so it's not scary. Yes. 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 Remove this. See if he's ready for the skateboard on its own. Yes. I'll do anything for this chicken, I swear. <laughs> yes, good boy. Very nice. Yes, yes. Very nice. Very nice. Now we want to get some on and off, because if we just stay on it and eat, we're not going to think about what we're doing. Pickles is like, that could be my chicken. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Beagle knows there is a crumb there. And now that was me failing to properly prevent the uh, skateboard from being scary. That's enough. He's allowed some. Yes. Treat him because I like the position of him. Yes. Yes, obviously, as you can see, timing is really key. Yes, jackpot. Good boy. Very nice. Good. Now I'm going to go through the steps a little faster than I would. So then we, OK, release. I usually throw the release this way. I don't want to reinforce the dog off the prop, but i got to set him up again. Very important to make sure it's not moving yet, because the fear of the movement is a criteria. Right now, our criteria is just get on it. <laughs> what if I lie here and be cute? <laughs> yes, a previously reinforced behavior. <laughs> hey, stick with me. Yes.
Yes. Two paws is more important, so I'll take the only two paws. Get back two, because that's a toughie. How do I get that chicken? Yes. Yeah, jackpot, jackpot. Nice, nice. Now, once that behavior is 80% um, done, we're going to add some movement. Yes. Yes, first we eat at the same time, and then we move and then eat. Yes. Yes. <laughs> as long as that chicken's a-flowing, we are okay. Yes. Yes. Look at that. Doesn't even care. Wow, that's fantastic. Now, this is really important to know in trick training. Very interesting. Whichever behavior we reinforce first becomes the strongest. So when we're skateboarding, if you reinforce four paws, you're going to have a heart for too long. You're going to have a hard time getting three. So relatively quickly, because he's okay with the movement, we're going to go. This is where I don't know how many of the guest speakers are crawling on the ground, but in dog training, it's what we do. We're going to go back to two, but we're going to crawl alongside him. Now, I've changed it. I'm not facing them. I'm beside them. They're very fine discriminators. They're not generalizers. Yes! I wasn't ready. I was looking for chicken. I'm sorry. OK, we're crawling this way. Yeah! <laughs> and then we start to add movement that way. I always resist the urge to lure and show. Yes. Here, here. Yes. Here we go. So we do two just to get movement. And, uh, and I think that's as far as we're going to get. Didn't he do fantastic? You proud of him, Mom? Oh, look at him go. Wow. <laughs> that's fantastic, buddy. All right. Now you're never going to come to me. <laughs> no. Yeah, so uh, we add the movement. And then eventually, look at I've made quite the mess of things here. Lollipop, you want to show us the final step? We would um, throw the treat that away. And the dog has to push the board back to us. And then we just start to reinforce three legs instead of two. Yeah, and there's one more piece that I work on um, for pivoting the back legs and rear end awareness um, so that he would think about pushing with his leg. We pivot on a block and we learn how to work our front legs independently of our back legs. Oh, look at that. That was fancy. Pickles is a beautiful pivoter. Get in. Pickles, this is your chance. Get in. Good, good. You ready? Get in, Pickles. All right, just like the cat. <laughs> All right, good girl. All right, so that's some of my secrets. Um, did you want to, so you said something about questions at yeah, the end? Sure. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, how can I get my dog to use the toilet, the actual toilet? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? The hand thing where you're the direction, you're giving that all the time. All the time. Yeah. So yeah. How, how did you get them started to, to take awareness of that without the reward? Um, I, uh, I start with uh, uh, short sniffing of the hand. Yes. And then I, reward placement is key. I treat with the same hand. And then I add the distance. And then Pickles is a nibbler. I prefer a toucher. <laughs> and, uh, and then I do that with all the animals. And it turns into um, a behavior chain. When you target my hand, then I'll bring you to the skateboard, which will bring you to the treat. And, it's, uh, it's, and then so that's one way of moving the animal. The other is marker training, which I'm big on. So we have blocks, and that they're supposed to go to the block. And it's actually one of the ways that I separate criteria for distance. So Pickles knows Mark. Or this Mark. 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 <laughs> Touch. No nibble. Mark. <laughs> Box. <laughs> and then uh, I actually teach everything on blocks, that I place the blocks where I want them to be. So this is my rear end block. And this is my front two legs block. So when I wanted a scooter, I put this on the end and this where I wanted the paws to go. And then the dog offers me the behavior and then I remove the blocks. And anytime I go from item to item, I, this is my four paws block. 
And so these to me are words, and I put the words where I want them so the dog understands and they learn relatively quick. Mm -hmm. I thought I had come up with that, but I saw a video by Bob Bailey and it turns out they've been doing it for years. So there it is, everything's been done. <laughs> Uh, is there any other questions? Yeah. So when you're treating, there's all that room for treats. And yeah. And they learn the behavior, and they're not getting treats. So what's sort of the thought on that in terms of um, people at home with dogs? Um, well, simple behaviors you can use environmental rewards, but you'll have to use occasional treats, or the behavior will fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, complex behaviors you'll have to pay more, but you can turn it into you make them do more and more for less. And I think the work becomes reinforcing. So another thing that I do is I will look at the dogs and I think, who are you? What are you good at? And I teach behaviors that uh, coincide with the personality. So that uh, these two are actually both, well, this one in particular is fearless on obstacles. And this one um, isn't fearless on obstacles as much. So I shouldn't say she skateboards, but she pushes a shopping cart. She hides in a suitcase. So I teach behaviors that go along with their personality and it helps them enjoy it more when, in terms of doing the show. Mm -hmm. So if I was doing him, I'd teach him to use his nose. Mm -hmm. And then it would be self-reinforcing. Mm -hmm. And uh, are, are any dogs more trainable, any breed more trainable than the next? Yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> funny story. My friend said to me, what number are Boston Terriers on the intelligence list that Dr. Stanley Corrin had come up with? And um, I had said, I don't know. And he says, well, your job is to find out, or is to work off their intelligence, shouldn't you know? I looked it up. The Boston Terrier is number 54 <laughs> on the intelligence list. The Border Collie is number one. But the Border Collie is a thinking dog. A Boston Terrier sees a skateboard and does it without, without questions. A Border Collie is, well, I think I, let me this. And so it provides a different challenge. And when you ask a Border Collie to do it, they're just giving you 10 things at once. So you're presented with the challenges of a thinking dog versus a dog that um, is just ready to go and respond to your, re respond to your cue. Um, but that said, these guys, mostly I have three Boston Terriers and the two of them are totally fearless. So I play off of their, shall I say, lack of intelligence. They would run straight off a cliff. Hey, ride a skateboard, no problem. <laughs> hey, get on that scooter, ride it down the ramp. All right, I'm sure it'll be fine. Whereas a border collie would be like, I don't know, I've thought this through. <laughs> this might not work out. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other questions you can think of? Perfect. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you for having me. I was happy to come and thank you.